All right, this is, these first questions, like as always, is true-false questions. We like true-false questions because we've got a 50-50 chance. But did you know a lot of times the people that are just winging their way through a test because of Murphy's Law will make do worse on the true-false part than they will the multiple-choice part? I don't know what that is. Tapered roller bearings on the ends of the shafts in the transmission absorb radial and thrust forces. Tapered roller bearings in the ends of the shafts absorb radial and thrust forces. Right. Grab one of these, Tyler. That's the one we're doing today. <coughs> you got to throw away though. Tapered roller bearings on the ends of the shafts absorb. All right. Somebody who shall remain nameless, tell me what radial forces are. What's radial forces? I have no clue. Radial means in a certain direction. Yeah. Well, the root word is similar. But if I have a shaft right here, and it has a force on it that's radial, then that's going to try to make it move this way, or that way, or that way, or back the other way. See, it's going to try to, that's a sideways thing. Now that's radial, right? It's moving in, in every which direction. Now if you're work, talking about a disc rotor like that, and you're talking about movement this way, that's lateral. That's lateral. So whenever you're talking about run out, or if you're talking about thrust forces, yeah, grab one of these. So this is a test where not the one I gave you, that's a different thing. All right. On a, on a disc rotor, and that's you to draw that to the disc. If you got something going on this way, that's called lateral run out or lateral thrust or whatever. If you've got a shaft and it's moving that way, that's actually a, a, a radial. So this is radial. That's lateral. But in this right here, you might see I'm actually going north, south, east, west with this in the center, as the center point. Talking about that. If on this shaft you have forces trying to push it forward and back, what do you think about that? That's actually thrust. See? Now, uh, on your... Uh, Crankshaft, and the ones of you guys that have built engines on the crankshaft, whenever you pull a uh, crankshaft out and put it back in, you've got thrust washer. thrust washer. Right, so what is that thrust, well, actually thrust bearing? So if the thrust bearing is there for what reason? When you mash the clutch on a manual transmission, you're pushing the crankshaft forward. That's thrust, okay? Whenever you uh, engage the, like put the automatic transmission in, gear, the torque converter is going to swell up a little bit because of all that fluid pressure, and that's going to push forward on the uh, crankshaft. <clears throat> and if you ever hear an engine that's making racket because of the crankshaft moving around, and you pull the bottom, you know, the pan off of it, and you look, and the thrust bearing worn out, you got something going on back there in the transmission area pushing that thing forward too hard. Torque converter get weak, something going on like that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, look, you need to understand these terms when I'm talking about radial, lateral run out, radial run out. Uh, radial run out on something like a disc rotor would be like this. See that? If it's spinning and the rotor's doing this, then you got, you know, but if it's spinning and the rotor's doing that, that's lateral. Okay. Now then, that's number one. Is Number one's going to be a true a true beat. Number Two, gear position is determined by which gear is locked to the main shaft. This is a transaxle now. We're not talking about a regular uh, manual transmission. We're talking about a transaxle. That, just remember that all of your answers need to be colored by that. Because uh, the transaxle is a little bit different from a tra regular transmission in the way that it works. That's why I got that transaxle sitting up there on the uh, table. All right. So gear position is determined by which gear is locked to the main shaft. That particular one is true you got to be able to find the main shaft. And i got a, a handout that we're going to help you out with on that later. <coughs> Number three, adjustments to the shift linkage may be made with the transmission in low gear or in neutral. I think you have important to this. This is a manual transmission. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay. okay. That's okay. That's, that's fine. That's not a problem. <laughs> If he was close enough, I'd give him a fist bump, you know. <laughs> Lawrence is a great encourager. When somebody really crashes and burns on something, uh, he gives them, yeah, man, all right, Boom, gives them a fist bump, you know. He's a, he encourages people. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, all right, now then, uh, 
<laughs> anyway, no, number three is false, and you can find the reasons for that in your book. Uh, Where's bagel at? <laughs> yeah. Bagel will probably stop to get a bagel. All right. <laughs> Synchronizer rings may have grooves or friction material on the inside circumference. Synchronizer rings may have grooves or friction material on the inside circumference. <clears throat> Remember what I told you about that? The synchronizer rings, those little brass blocker rings, sometimes they're cast material of some other kind. The little uh, area where the synchronizer ring goes on there, inside, you know, you're going to have some little teeth around here. This is actually like a cutaway. This is a slightly cone shape. And if they have to have something to enable them whenever you're starting to shift into that gear, for it to drive that synchronizer ring against this cone-shaped surface which is polished, they've either got to have little grooves here, kind of like tire tracks to cut through the oil film, or they got to have some kind of lining. Because it's got to grab a hold of that and force this particular gear you're getting ready to go into to pick up speed or to slow down, whichever way it needs to go, so that your uh, collar can slide over that. So, synchronizer ring number four is a true one, yeah. So just remember that. I really I should have a synchronizer ring in my hand to show you that, but I don't have one. <clears throat> There's some over there, but I don't have one to show you. And if I hadn't been remiss in my duty, I would have had one right here to hold in my hand and show you. Side bearing preload is measured with an inch-pound torque wrench and a tool that fits over the pinion, pinion shaft. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about preload anyway? Everybody understand what preload is? Not really. What you need? Okay, that's why we, that's why I need to be talking to you here. You know, on the uh, the bearings on the uh, front of the ever, just about everybody in here has already packed the bearings on the Ranger, right? Mm -hmm. You've had the Ranger the, the front wheel off, and on that Ranger you've got little uh, tapered bearings riding in races, right? You got tapered bearings with rollers and all this, and they're riding in these races and all like that right there. And on the other side you got one that's slightly bigger, you know, and it's made the same way. It's got a bunch of rollers in there, and it's riding in a race and all that. And in between, you got your shaft that they're riding on. Okay, now, out here, you got a washer, you got some threads, and you got a nut. Okay, now, even when those bearings aren't moving, you're going to, if you tighten that nut up to a certain amount, these bearings are going to be loaded X number of, you know, amount, whatever you'll call it. You don't need to put a lot of preload on a disc rotor, even though it uses the same kind of bearings. Now, why? what's the difference between a disc rotor? You remember your uh, that rear axle that you were working on? Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, you know, the, the ring gear actually bolts to here. Right. And you don't want the ring gear moving this way and that and flopping around all over the place. So you better have those bearings pushed together pretty strong so that the only thing this can do is turn. You don't want it moving this way and that. You don't do none of that because it's going to, you know, knock and miss and the gears and all kinds of stuff. That's not a big deal on this rotor. That's why I was talking about you. You could take that nut, and some of you may remember that you pack it, pack the bearings with grease, put it together, put the seal on this end, and when you turn that thing with your finger, you just turn it with your finger as tight as you can turn it, and you spin the rotor to make sure all the rollers are seated and everything's like it ought to be. Then you put your kata key in there. Now, like I said the other day, I had some yo-yo put an impact wrench on that darn thing and wipe the threads out. The threads aren't very strong on that. They don't need to be. All right, so that's this one here, you can give it enough preload with your finger, and if it's just got a tiny little bit of slop, it doesn't matter that much. It does need to have, you know, pretty much zero movement, but it doesn't have to be preloaded like a like the bearings in a rear end or in a transmission. If you got these kind of bearings in anything, you have to have a certain amount of pressure on those bearings before they ever do anything to make sure that the shaft only can, can't do nothing but turn. So preload is to stop it from moving, right? Preload is to fix it where all it can do is turn. You don't want it moving forward and back. You don't want it flopping around. The preload is how tight you're going to be holding it before everything starts to turn. And that's pretty much what it is. Now, how do we measure that? That's the next point. Well, yes, no, not really. You're thinking about the backlash. Yeah, okay. See what I'm saying? The, you're going to actually take and... What I'm going to do, and I've actually got an exercise where we do this on the rear end out there in driveline next semester. Um, but as you tighten that nut, let's say we wanted to put a certain amount of preload on these bearings, 
whatever we're there in. And we got to be able to turn this thing that we're uh, working on. Uh, so the, and we got to be able to tighten that nut a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and squeeze these bearings a little tighter, a little tighter, a little tighter. We took a torque wrench, and that torque wrench we're going to put it on so that we're turning this thing and driving these bearings. And it's going to have like 20 inch pounds that it takes to keep it moving. You know, whatever the spec calls for. However many inch pounds it takes to keep it moving is telling you how much. Now this is without grease. This is running dry. See what I mean? So you're running those bearings clean and dry, and you're going to measure that preload. Now doing your rear ends, whenever you take them, you originally, I told you, you got a whole bunch of shims you're supposed to start out with. You actually get your backlash set, and you know the pattern on the gears and all that hogwash. You get that like you're supposed to, but you got gear, you got sh uh, bushings. I mean, excuse me, shims that you can stick in there with your thumbs. All right, so you get made this snug, but you can stick them in there with your thumbs. Once you get your, uh, uh, you know, you're going to add thickness to this one and subtract from that one. You're always using the same thickness, but you're moving the gear back and forth. Once you get everything like it's supposed to be, say, ha, perfect backlash. That's just what I want. Then you're supposed to add four thousandths of an inch to each one of those shims, unless it's, if it's a GM or a Ford, it runs from four to six thousandths, depending on, you know, how you read. Add that, and you got a special tool where you drive them things in there, and they are really, really tight. And that's going to preload that carrier, you know, like I'm talking about here. Uh, but now, in transaxles like this, axles like this one over here, it's got little cone bearings on each end. When you put it together, you're going to actually put your a, a little uh, inch-pound torque wrench on it with a needle, and you're going to pull it. You're going to make sure that it's got the right amount of preload. All right. And that's what preload's all about. How tight are the bearings before anything starts to turn? That's what preload is. You see what I'm saying? You want them to do that so the shafts don't move any way except, they're not supposed to do nothing except turn. Okay. That's side bearing preload. That's actually side to side. You know, in the, each end of the transmission. Because those gears lay in there horizontally, right? Not naturally. And you know, the, uh, Something else is vaguely uh, similar to that. Uh, the transmission that everybody was, that y'all pulled apart and put back together, you know, that Nagel pulled apart and put back together, and uh, has got cone-shaped bearings in that. And you're actually supposed to change shims in there to preload those, too. Those bearings got to be preloaded. The way it is now, they're not preloaded the way they should be. But that's typically the way it is when lots of students pull them apart and put them back together. Although they are not very economical, <coughs> Mechanical or cable linkages are used in most manual transaxles because they're reliable. Although they're not very economical, mechanical or cable linkages are used in most manual transaxles because they are reliable. What does your book say about that? Anybody read your book? I want you to give me a. I want you to give me a reading on that. Uh, what book are you in? This one right here. That one right there. That the one that says if it says, yeah, it's got transmissions in it. Dig that out, guys. I want to know what the reason is for that question. I'm gonna jump past that question and move on. Then we're gonna come back to it. I mean, I know what the answer is, but I want, I want you guys to know. I want you to know what your book says about that. So I'll make you dig it up. Okay, make them dig it up. And uh, these guys over here that aren't looking in their books will just benefit from your hard work. And y'all will, will know more than them. You can go get it if you want to. I'm going to go on to the next question. <laughs> gears and gear sets on manual transaxles. Here, here it is, guys. Gears and gear sets on manual transaxles are similar, similar to rear wheel drive manual synchro mesh transmissions. Well, yes. They're very similar, but there are two shafts with a shift fork, one to each shaft, and this kind of thing. And, you know, typically. All transaxle models have the same disassembly procedure. That has got to be false. That's, that's downright silly. When assembling a transaxle, rotate the side gears at least one full revolution prior to measuring backlash. What in the world is backlash? Oh, okay, thank you. You did. You did it on your rear end. On the uh, backlash is this. Yeah. How much movement you got between the gears? Why is it desirable to have some backlash? You don't want too much, but you don't want to have too little either. Unless you're talking about camshafts. You know, if you got a camshaft or whatever, you don't make noise. But, I mean, transmissions, you got to have a little backlash because if they heat up, they're going to seize them gears. The gears going to seize up. I've still got, like, a little play in the Typically, it will have you. 
and that's backlash since you're here filling in the rear end. And all that. So, tum, 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 tum. And that, whenever you're working with gears like in a you know drive line, you got to have that. I like to say cam cam shaft's got to have to be real tight, but a drive shaft's got to be just because of the nature is just heady steady pull. And you don't want those gears heating up and you know starting to swell up a little bit because all that stuff gets you know. Uh, if you, you, there's got to be a little room for oil to be between those gears too, see, because you don't have steady metal to metal contact, you know, and oil's supposed to get between there, what it's supposed to do. But, number nine, when assembling a transaxle rotate the side gears at least one full revolution prior to measuring backlash. You remember on our rotors on our truck how we had to spin it through? A lot of times you tighten that nut all the way up. And then when you turn the rotor, you tighten it a little more. Remember that? So things change when those rollers start to move around and find where they want number to be. Number eight is false, isn't it? Number eight is false. Number nine is true. For proper, and number ten, for proper transaxle maintenance, manufacturers recommend changing the lubricant only if it becomes contaminated. False. Only if it becomes contaminated. That's actually true. Really? Yep. If it's not contaminated. All right, now let me ask you this. Why are they wanting automatic transmission fluid changed? But they don't really care about manual transmission fluid. Anybody think about that? Why do they want uh, automatic transmission fluid and engine oil changed, and even power steering fluid and brake fluid? All those fluids are supposed to be changed. But why are we not worried about differentials and manual transmissions? Why is that not? Why is that something we don't need to worry about? No, we don't need to worry about changing it, huh? Don't think about it. I mean, I ain't never think about. I ain't even know they were all in a reinstall part of my <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're still enclosed, but it go anywhere. They don't have any kind of combustion or anything to cause the oil to go bad. On an automatic transmission, if an automatic transmission fluid starts to get really hot, like if let's say that you hooked up your uh, you hooked up your uh, something heavy to your truck and you dragged the uh, some dragged it all the way to wherever. Uh, and that torque converter is seriously shearing that fluid, and the torque, I mean, the, the transmission temperature goes up to 220, 225, 230 degrees. Uh, that changes the properties of that automatic transmission fluid, and it gets all gummy and starts to cause problems, and it causes valves to stick. On an automatic, on, as far as an automatic transmission goes, it's kind of funny. Uh, for a little while, when my son uh, moved back over here from Georgia, I gave him a. Uh, car that we had bought for like five hundred dollars which was a uh it was like a 86 little ltd you ever see those cars yeah, yeah the little ltds and uh and they were really solid short cars body. huh short yeah shorter body and it's sort of you know but anyway he drove that thing he had a 3.8 in it had a little i think it had a c5 transmission in it and all that yeah. <laughs> Can't get that thing to pay any attention. I had to get it to shut up. All right. Now then, right here, uh, what we got? Let me tell you about this. He would drive down the road, and all of a sudden, and this is an automatic transmission story. All of a sudden, it would start pushing fluid out the vent and just make a terrible mess. Just a mist of transmission. Fluid. Yeah. All right. Now, what happens there is the transmission starts to get hot, and uh, what we would do on that one, what you need to do on that one, is put you a good external transmission cooler on it because the transmission cooler part in the radiator if the radiator partially got a bunch of rusty crud around the transmission cooler part in there it's not cooling good enough and that fluid that transmission fluid starts to boil so if you take a couple of hoses and you run it to a transmission cooler that goes in front of the radiator all of that will go away but you need to put fresh fluid in it because if that fluid has been hot enough to boil you're going to have issues. So change your fluid and put a transmission cooler on it. And if it's got a modulator valve, change that too. Yes, you, got a you know, pop, pop a new modulator valve in there, put a transmission cooler in front of the radiator, put new fluid in it, and all those problems will go away. See what I'm saying? That's what you got to do. All right. But uh, anyway, if you don't have anything in these manual transmissions or in the rear end doing anything to cause the fluid to break down, now if you ever go through a, a, a Water, you know, type of drive through water that's real deep, and you're, or maybe they're sitting in water for a while that's halfway up the doors, or something like that. The vent may have let enough water in there to where you're going to need to drain them and put new fresh oil in them because there may be some water contamination in there. So, but that's about the only thing that can happen to that. So, that's about it. I'll tell you something else though. Um, if there's metal filings coming, you know, that's in that rear end for because there's something coming apart, you're going to have issues because of that. So 
Uh, you don't usually have any kind of a problem with that. You, a rear end can be noisy. The rear end on my Jeep Cherokee has been singing a little bit ever since it had 11,000 miles on it. It's got 170,000 on it now. I never worried about it because I knew what it was. And, uh, but if it's making a roaring or a rumbling noise, you got bearings coming apart in there. If it's, a, if it's a singing or a whining noise, if you don't like it, that's fine. Remember what we did on this uh, silly little uh, rear end in this Ford Explorer that we had? We pulled the back off of it and smeared valve grinding compound all over the gears and ran it all day until it burned about a half a tank of gas and just let that valve grinding compound match the gears. And then we washed all that mess out of there real good and put it back together. And the noise, that the singing noise it had been making, was almost 90% of it was gone. If I'd have ran it longer, it would have quieted completely down because <laughs> I matched the gears. That won't fix bad bearings. Because the first rear differential chunk he had had bad bearings in it, you see. And that one there, I told him, I said, we got nothing to lose. I got this other rear. Let's put it in there and run it and see what he can do. He's driving a stew out of that thing right now. Happy the lark with it, you know. No complaints. We can spend you $1,000 on another rear end or $400 on some more gears and we can set them up or we can pop this rear end in there and you can drive it for a while. I get it. It don't cost nothing but the wall. See? My rear end, uh, I brought from, uh, what is that place you know, Dex. Yeah. I bought a rear end from him, but uh, it's a positive traction, but uh, it got like a little rumbling like noise in it. I ain't never know what it was, though. Yeah. You know, it, when you drive it, be like, <laughs> what is that? What kind of car is it? What is that vehicle? It's a uh, box Chevrolet. Yeah. It's uh, 85, but it came yeah. out of, you know, what he said, a Well, drive it and listen to that for a while, and then one day when you got time, uh, huh? Well, I tore it up. Oh, you, tore, oh, you already <laughs> tore it up? Well, now. But, but I, I mean, the rear end, I mean, it's hurt. I'll pull the motor up here. Yeah, yeah. But the rear end, I always used to hit that noise, and I didn't never know what it was. Yeah. Well, if you pull a, uh, what you need to do if you drive it a while and you pull that cover off and look in there if there's not any metal filings in the oil mm -hmm. uh, and you don't see any teeth knocked off of any gears, mm -hmm. you can probably drive it for a long time without if you're not bothered by the noise. Most of the customers, you know, like, you know, Mama with her little youngins going to the soccer place over oh, here, yeah. she ain't going to want to hear that nonsense. She's going to yeah, quiet. Yeah, I'm just going to test something up, man. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, you, you already car tore up the car anyway, so it ain't a big deal. <laughs> the other end of it is, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, two advantages of using a transaxle or what? Incidentally, Tim was uh, uh, true. Only if it becomes contaminated do you change it. Uh, two advantages of using a transaxle or what? A, good vehicle balance and efficient design for better space utilization. B, easy accessibility for repairs and improved front tire wear. Uh, C, efficient design for better space utilization and easy accessibility for repairs. Or D, improved traction and improved front tire wear. They keep talking about front tire wear. The tires on a, the tires on a front wheel drive vehicle wear out quick, don't they? Usually the right front one is the right front one. You know what my wife used to do? She does a little tempo. They had a front wheel drive, and somehow or another, she whatever she take, she's a pretty aggressive driver. Now she don't drive crazy, but she's kind of impatient and she wants to get going. Yeah. And she would somehow park on this white stripe, and when she would go to take off, she'd burn it out. They were, you know. I mean, you wouldn't ever if you if you just talked to her or watched her, you know, looked at her car, you would never know. But she wore the right front tire almost down to the cords on that tempo, and I said, wow. So I rotated them. I let it roll my hair for a while, and then she wore that one out too, but the ones on the left side looked good. So he took it to the tire store, and the tire store guy says, I don't understand this. These tires are the same age, but the right ones are both more slick, you know, because I had rotated them. Anyway, it was funny. But uh, she says, I don't understand why this car just spins when I get ready to take off. I want it to go. <laughs> but when you park on the white stripe, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, people take it stop. Back at a country boy trick people used to do, they take a bunch of, a bunch of the big guys, you know, at the school over there. And they take a watermelon rind. Yeah. You know, eat a watermelon, take watermelon rind. Somebody pick the guy's truck up and put a watermelon rind under his truck. When he gets ready to take off, <laughs> he ain't going over where he burns through that watermelon rind. <laughs> I mean, that watermelon rind is just as slick as it can be, and that truck ain't going nowhere. You know, it's like it being stuck in a ditch. But uh, anyway, or they jack it up just a little bit and get the wheel just off the ground. All right, now then, uh, yeah. let's see. That one there, number 11, by the way, is A, a good vehicle balance and efficient design for better space utilization. Excuse me for getting off track. Which of the following is not suggested when attempting to identify the source of manual tra transaxle and drivetrain noise? Which of the following is not suggested? The vehicle's owner should be driving. Is that A? B is listen for noise with the vehicle at rest and the clutch engaged. Uh, C is the vehicle should be driven long enough to warm all lubricants. Or D, the technician should be driving. I say 
actually, it's not suggested when attempting to identify the source of manual transaction and drive, transaction and drive chain noise. Uh, if the technician is driving it, believe it or not, and it's something the owner's complaining about, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Let me tell you how many times when I was working over there on some of all the shops, you know, I didn't work in all that many shops. I worked at one for 15 years and some other ones before that for about 10 years. But if you draw a ticket on a car that's making some kind of a noise, and you drive that car, you're liable to hear a noise that bothers you, and you're liable to go after that noise, and you're liable to fix that noise. And when the customer gets the car back after you worked on it two and a half hours fixing that noise that you heard, he's going to say, that's not the noise I was talking about. Now what are you going to do? Think about what I'm telling you here. You spent two and a half hours of labor time and his money fixing a noise he didn't even care about. And now there's this other noise that you didn't even touch that you didn't see as all that significant, but he wants that one fixed. That's the point. You better set that customer's fanny behind the steering wheel. You better be riding with him, and you better make sure that you and him both know what noise he's talking about. Now, this is something I'm, I'm giving you guys the benefit of having learned this the hard way. Because you will work your rear end off on one trying to fix something that they know they complain about. Oh, I wasn't even worried about that noise, and to you it was horrible. See what I'm saying? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this noise over here. See what I'm saying? Now, and I'll tell you something else too. You better you better match the conditions that were in the vehicle. Uh, like for instance, uh, they managed to find out that this click 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 noise that was happening on this Jeep uh, Cherokee, uh, this click 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 noise only happens with Nicholas Daigle sitting on the left rear side. And so what we did was we, we loaded up, we loaded a, a bunch of people in there. We did. And uh, the shop foreman came and he says, the shop foreman comes and he says, everybody get in here. I need big heavy boys in this Jeep. So we took off. And I could hear it going click, 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 click. And I said, stop. Johnny, stop it. Stop the vehicle. Pull it over beside the road. And so he pulled over beside the road and I got under the Jeep and I did something. And I got out, and we sat down in it, we took off, and there was no more noise. What was it? And the park brake cable was hitting the tire weight, but it only happened when there was a bunch of heavy guys in there. And uh, and what was funny to me was the shop foreman says, you must have run into this before. I said, nope, never seen it. That makes him want to choke you, you know, because how did you figure it out so quick? Well, the way I figured it out so quick was my friend over there had a Comanche, which is the same thing except it's a pickup, and he said when he loaded a bunch of feed, in the back of the truck and it would squat down it would go click, 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 click. And if you move this little spring so that it pulls the park brake cable away from the tire, you don't ever hear that anymore. But the weight on the tire was slapping that park brake cable, see. But anyway, you got to match the same. Uh, you gotta, to begin with, you got to know what the customer is talking about. Let them drive it because they may drive it a different way than what you're going to drive it. Um, here's another little thing. This guy brought a 65 vintage, 65 Mustang. Beautiful car. For 289 in it. Over there, and he said, I want a tune up done by the best guy you got. Well, for some strange reason, they decided that was me. So I put points and plugs and, in there and did, did everything just like you would have had, you know, ignition contact points in it. And this car was, I'm talking about, it was gorgeous. It was showroom material. It was just beautiful. The carpet was new, the, steer, the chrome looked good, there was, there was no broke glass, and everything was perfect. I drove the car, I didn't feel anything wrong with it. And, uh, and I didn't see any reason to replace any of the spark plug wires or anything because they were all just about new, you know. And so uh, this guy uh, drove it after he came back, and then he says, it's still not fixed. And so the shop foreman says, well, let me ride it with you. And so uh, when they came back, the shop foreman says, he was tacking this thing out to a nearly 7,000 RPM and just driving the absolute crap out of it. And that's when he would feel it missing a little bit. And I said, well, you think I'm going to drive a 65 Mustang that way that's not my car? You know what I'm saying? I'm going to... But what was wrong? What was going on there? And this is kind of off the transmission thing. You know the spark plug wires that used to go through these boots right here. You know they go through a boot and then they snap down in the cap. You remember the old kind? This one here, that got the little terminal that was supposed to snap in the cap, was pulled back and what snapped in the cap good. You couldn't look at it and tell. But see, he had put new wires on it and he didn't snap them down in there good. You know I probably should have pulled them out and looked at them. But it looks so new. You know what's the good deal on that? Anyway, when I snapped that one down in there, I actually hooked the, the scope up to it and saw that one of them had like 20,000 volts more than the rest of them firing. That's how I found that. But anyway, this business, the customer was wanting to drive this thing like Mario Andretti, uh, like he's trying to tear the darn thing up. And it's, and here, and it's such a it's thing. Just about to throw it all to pieces. I mean, that's the way he drove the thing, you know, and it was, but it didn't look like it. It looked it was, huh? 
No. <laughs> it was just a plain old factory car. It didn't even have it had didn't even have fancy wheels on it. It was just you know. But I don't want him to want to drive it like that. I sure wouldn't. If it was mine. I want to drive it that way. Um, all right, but uh, that's a true story. Anyway, I was uh, of course none of these stories I, I say are uh, are false, you know. But the names are changed to protect the innocent. I just they just come to mind, you know. I don't know these guys. I remember them. Some of them I remember. There's a lot of stories I can tell that I don't remember. And if I do remember them, I'll make sure I tell them to you. Okay. All right. Yeah. There you go. I said that on purpose. You fell for it. Uh, the, the the technician should not be driving the car if you're going to be looking for a noise. Number 12 is going to be D, as in Delta or Dog or whatever. Uh, customer complains that his or her car is stuck in gear. You identify all the possible causes except, okay, if it's stuck in gear, uh, you got A, a damaged synchronizer assembly, B, a worn internal shifter mechanism, C, a damaged external shifter mechanism, or D, an extraction of the case vent tube. What do you think? I think D, D, D. Which one? Dog. Dog. What do you think, guys? And uh, obstruction of the case vent tube, according to the answer key, is the right answer for that. Obstruction of the case vent tube. <laughs> that must be talking about one particular transmission, because I have no, I have no mental capacity to understand why that would cause it to be stuck in gear. Um, oh, I do, will tell you that sometimes when people are speed shifting, they'll wind up with the shifter getting. It'll be in a, in one gear, and they'll click the shifter out of the place so that the shifter's in neutral, but one of the forks is in gear, and then the shifter won't move, and you're always in second gear or something like that. I've seen that before, and then you got to get out of On those Volkswagen bugs, that would happen, and you'd have to get in there and take the oil fill plug out of the side of the transmission, reach out of the screwdriver, and go click, and then when you did that, you got them. That's what you got to do on the Yeah. Well, anyway. All right. Let's move on. Question number 14. This one and two more, and then we're done. Except Daigle, he's got to start over from the beginning. Uh, what, uh, Daigle, did you stop and get a bagel? No. <laughs> Honestly, I was standing, I started, I started driving towards a camp for some odd reason. I've done that kind of thing. And you should realize, whoa, I'm our halfway in Gantt. I need to turn around and go to a walk. Well, you were, you, were, you were driving along kind of zoned out thinking about other things. I've actually done that, believe it or not. I mean, I, I hate to admit it, but I have. I've actually got on the wrong road and said, wait a minute, where am I going? Do you ever do that? Yeah, I think I have. I've done it, you know, but at least, <laughs> yeah, at least I didn't drive all the way to Phoenix, Arizona, and then had to come back to El Paso or something like that. You know? but, uh, I've actually done that before. You know, if you're thinking about other things while you're driving, you know, driving is sort of a no-brainer operation. You can go in the wrong direction and go a long way. Um, while inspecting the transaxle and clutch housing cases during disassembly, the service technician notices that it appears to be a crack in the transaxle case and some nicks and burrs in the mating surfaces. Which of the following statements is incorrect? Okay, nicks and burrs are common imperfections that will not interfere with manual with normal functioning. Nicks and burrs should be removed with a fine stone or a foul. Okay, alloy casting perfections may appear to be cracks. D. Case integrity should be checked using a dye penetrant solution. That's a bunch of complicated stuff. What would you think? Uh, let's look at it. Let's look at what we're talking about. Notice is what appears to be a crack in a transaxle case and nicks and burrs on the mating surfaces. Now, which of the following is incorrect? Nicks and burrs are common imperfections that will not interfere with normal function. Nicks, that's that. A is the one that's incorrect. Um, one time I had to take a transmission and replace the housing on it in a uh, 78 one-ton Ford pickup truck and uh, stripped all the gears out of that thing, ordered a transmission case, came all the way from Wisconsin or somewhere. And in those days, UPS wouldn't haul anything that weighed over 50 pounds. And so uh, they wouldn't. If it weighed over 50 pounds, they wouldn't haul it. I mean, they wouldn't, you know, because it's more than a driver to pick up, an insurance regulation thing. And so uh, they put it on the scale up in Wisconsin, and it weighed 49 and a half pounds. And when they got it off the truck down here in Beaumont, Texas, it weighed 50 and a half pounds. Wow. So they sent it back. I think the scale were out of calibration or something. Or, you know what I'm saying? It was just, the scales didn't quite weigh the same. You know how scales are. You know, you step on one scale and you weigh this much. It was like that. And they put that case back in the box. They sent it right back to where it came from. Mm -hmm. And then I said, where's my dad gun case at? And I went, I don't know. So they, you know, they checked it out. And they sent it again. And it got down here, they weighed it, and they sent it right back again. I waited for that transmission case for a month. 
finally got it over there. We'll come pick it up if we have to. Don't send it back again. You know, that was when you, the UPS runs the tightest ship in the shipping business, with all due respect, you know. They, uh, when the transmission is in fourth gear, hour of the year is engaged. Fourth gear is locked to the main ship. This is on a transaxle now, not a regular transmission. Remember that. When the transmission is in fourth gear, A, fourth gear is locked to the main shaft and all synchronizers are in their center positions. B, the third, fourth synchronizer remains in the neutral position. C, third gear is unlocked, fourth gear is locked to the main shaft. D, first gear is locked to the main shaft, the second, third synchronizer move forward. Let me tell you this, you will never see a question like this on an ASE test. You just won't. It's okay if it's an open book thing and you're looking right at the book when you do it, but if somebody gives you all of this stuff, you're going to be sitting here and your gears are going to be turning in your head faster than these. Wait a minute, what are you talking about here? How can I parse this? How can I figure it out? Uh, actually, third gear is unlocked and fourth gear is locked to the main shaft. If you really, really understand transaxles really well, third gear is unlocked and fourth gear is locked to the main shaft. That's it. Okay, now, on 16, uh, to check transaxle lubricant level, start by A, removing the speedometer cable or wire harness, B, removing the speed sensor or the driven gear, C, removing the gear or speed sensor, D, removing the case bolt from the transaxle case. Actually, <clears throat> what they're wanting you to do, what we would do, I'll tell you something that's kind of funny. As a matter of fact, I think if you look on here, if you look on here, maybe not on here. Yeah, it's the same way. There is actually a picture on this transmission case somewhere. It's right there. That's what i got to show you. Look right there. See that? Where the speed sensor goes. See that picture? It tells you there's where you put the wall in, where the uh, you put the wall in, where the uh, speedometer, I mean where the uh, speedometer drive goes, and it'll actually got a picture on the side of that case telling you that if the oil is at the top of the gear, it's full. So when you pull the the the, trans, the cable with the gear on it on that transaxle, it's actually your dipstick. So when you pull that cable out, if it's if the gear if it's wet just to the top of the gear, then you got plenty of fluid, and you add it where the cable goes. But it's a big old hole. Like now, not all manual transmissions are like that, but a lot of them are. Okay. All right. Everybody got that? So it is C this? Yeah, that one there is actually going to be an A. Remove the speedometer cable or wiring harness. And see, so they're thinking you're going to have to pull the cable off or the wire harness off in order to, you know, yank that thing out of there. Usually, I just leave that stuff up.